thought that you were at the MB3 evaluation session, then you thought wrong and you should be next door. <laughs> um, so we have got a back-to-back -back session right now. Um, we'll have a break in the middle. Um, and the purpose of this session is really to go into a much deeper level of detail regarding the process for developing a, an MP3 in your state or tribe. Um, and we're gonna start at the beginning and we're gonna go through the whole process and we are gonna hear from folks from five different states who are at various points in their MP3 development process and they are gonna share um, bits and pieces of their um, experience there. And then you guys are also gonna have um, an opportunity to do some reflection and some small group conversations about what's going on in your state. You'll have a chance, hopefully, our, our intent is that you'll have a chance to actually start to make some progress on what needs to happen in your state and you know, thinking through some things that, that need to um, happen and do that in a structured way. We'll have some handouts that we'll be handing out in a, in a moment. Um, so the, uh, the first part of our session before the break, we are going to go into um, how to get started in your MP3 development process. And then we're also going to talk about what are the elements of an MP3. Um, so we'll get into a little bit more detail about what should actually be included in an MP3, which is obviously highly specific to the state or tribe that you're in, but um, we are going to talk about how that, that process unfolds. We'll be doing that before the break. When we come back after the break, I'll tell you what we're going to do then. Um, to do that, to help us have that conversation, we've got, um, first off, we've got Andy Whittington from Mississippi, who is going to give us um, some thoughts on how the Mississippi plan has unfolded, and, and that has actually ended up being a template for some of the other states who are now embarking on this process. Andy is the Environmental Programs Coordinator for the Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation, and he's also a member of the Pesticide Policy Dialogue Committee um, for American Farm Bureau. Um, so Andy, I'd like to go ahead and bring, there you are, you're like right behind the thing. I was like, where is he? There he is. Yep. Live. So, is this, this is good? Okay. So, yeah, so I sit on this pesticide policy dialogue committee because I apparently really pissed somebody off in a previous life. And that is where the impetus for this came from in Mississippi. When I sat through the first meeting and I said, well, well. So I went home, yes, I went home and uh, I met with several key people and I said, we've got a problem and we need to start working on it now. So I'm just going to run through kind of where we started and I'm probably not going to get very I'm going to get real detailed in, in how we got started and not so much with what we wound up with. So we met with our four or five people that I knew were going to be key in this. Uh, some of them are, well, he's not in the room now, so I'll say Don Parker was one. He was very knowledgeable about this. We met with our state entomologist and our apiculturist, and we said, okay, we got to map out a plan. Our first meeting was with row crop producers by themselves. We had our Farm Bureau, Farm Bureau is structured for something like this to happen anyway. We've got members on both sides of the table, so we knew that this was gonna be a pretty serious issue for us. We already have commodity programs, so we had chairman and vice chairman for each of our major commodity groups. That's, that's the first people we met with. Uh, cotton, soybeans, corn, uh, feed grains. So we had a pretty good, we had a pretty good come to Jesus meeting with them and told them, you have a huge problem that you don't even know about. And that was where we started from. And that was July of 2013. And we did not know this was an issue. Uh, so that's where we kind of had to start. Now, the first thing you're going to have to do when you're developing a state plan is you've got to figure out what kind of situation you're in. If you have bees in the state, what are they doing? Why are they there? Because 
what you're trying to accomplish is going to be dictated by that. Bees in Mississippi typically don't ever leave Mississippi. They're there for honey production, and that's pretty much it. And those bees, uh, beekeepers that are making honey, want to be near row crops. They, they beg farmers to let them on their fields. They know they're going to have some losses, and they're perfectly okay with that because the honey they make off of a soybean crop is 50% higher than what they're going to make anywhere else in the state. They look for it. They want to be there. So we knew that one of the big issues that we were going to have is maintaining that relationship between the farmers and the beekeepers. After we got the farmers accumulated, then we started bringing in the other groups. So we figured out what our, what our goals were. What did we need to do? We needed to raise awareness, number one, and we realized that first off. We wanted to be proactive. We were... We feel like we were early on in the process of trying to get these things done. We knew that our plan was going to have to be a little flexible, and we wanted it to be that way just so, because it, to be honest, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just putting some stuff together with some, some thoughts. So we wanted to be flexible in our design, in design and implementation just so we could change it up if we needed to. But we knew the main thing we wanted to do <clears throat> was it, foster this relationship between the farmers and the beekeepers because I didn't want to create a whole lot of headache for myself. So that's where we started. So it, I'm from Mississippi, so we're going to make gumbo today. <clears throat> and you will leave here not only knowing how to develop a pollinator plan, but you're going to make a pretty good gumbo if you pay, if you pay pretty good attention. The first thing you got to do when you start with gumbo is one, you got to get good ingredients. You can't start with terrible ingredients. And people are your main ingredient in, in what you're going to do. Meaning, you've got to have the right people in the room. You don't want to be chasing rabbits all day, and you don't want, you know, this person says this, this person says that. You have to know your people and who you're going to be working with who's reasonable, who can sit down, have a conversation, and, and be open-minded and try and understand the issues that each other's facing. And, and to be honest, our row crop producers and, farm and beekeepers did not know what each other's problems were. The general rule is beekeeper calls a farmer and says, hey, I need to put my bees, can I put my bees on your farm? And the farmer's like, yeah, just don't put them in the turn row. If, as long as they're not in the way, I don't care. And, then, you know, at the end of the year, he gets about three gallons of honey from them. He's like, here, thanks. And that's their relationship. That was the extent of it. So you got to bring your farmers in. They don't know they've got a problem. It's a pretty big issue, as we've all seen. So you really have to get the message across to them you may not want to be involved, but you're involved up to your neck. So, and uh, so the, you you got to bring your farmers along, and and then you can add in your beekeepers, and you know you got to whip them up slow. And it, this is going to be your root for your gumbo. And if you know anything about you, if you know anything about root. You cannot cook a roux fast, you'll burn it. <clears throat> and then your whole gumbo is going to taste, got that little burnt taste. You got to bring, mix them together slowly and simmer them for a while, and then you'll wind up with a good roux. So then you got to add your Holy Trinity in, <clears throat> which if you know what a Holy Trinity is, it's onion, celery, and bell pepper. But here, it's your entomologist. Uh, your Department of Ag and your Apiculturist. These are your experts. They're going to be able to answer questions that you have on both sides. Uh, they're going to provide information to each other, and they're really going to develop what your plan turns out to be. And then you spice it up with whoever else you think, whoever else you can think of that's going to need to be involved in this process. For us, it was our ag consultants. They had to be at the table. Ag aviation. Ag aviation was necessary to be at the table. They were there to get an education too. Uh, the Ag Industries Councils. Uh, we don't. 
we talked with some of the uh, product manufacturers, the the chemical guys. We didn't br we don't bring them out very often. We use them for expertise, just because you, for lack of a better term, you lose a little bit of credibility the more they're involved. It just looks to some people that well you're just a shield for the year. So we consulted with them and they for the most part understood why they why we weren't taking a lot of money from them and putting their light, putting their logo on anything. <clears throat> so just like everything else, <clears throat> nobody's nobody's going to like everything. Uh, this is why you debate whether or not you put okra in your gumbo. <clears throat> I, personally, if you put okra in your gumbo, I think you'd probably cheer for Ole Miss or something like that also. <laughs> but this, is also, this also gets into uh, how you're going to develop your plan because everybody's plan is not going to be the same. If you're north of I-10, you know, you, your gumbo is going to be chicken and sausage or duck and sausage. If you're south of I-10, it's going to be a seafood gumbo. But the thing about gumbo is you can make gumbo however you want to. It's just what are you putting in there that uh, that fits you. So this is kind of where you draw that line of what are we going to focus on. Let's not waste our time on some of this stuff. We knew that we knew early on that a label that says you can only apply at night was not going to fly in Mississippi. There was no way that was ever going to be in the plan. And we knew from talking to beekeepers that having a bee registry was never going to fly. We didn't even talk about them. They never came up. There were a couple of other things we kicked around back and forth where we agreed to disagree. And that tended to be the that's the only way you can move forward. They're not going to agree on everything. So just figure out what they can agree to and what they want. So what we wound up with was the three pillars of our program, which is communication, which is necessary, a, a set of cooperative standards, and we let our state apiculturists and entomologists develop those. And then we're still trying to figure out how we're going to incorporate this habitat restoration in. Is that one, is that the one minute thing? Okay, so we talked about the this the flag. The flag came up just because it was a way to appease them on the registry. <clears throat> but what we found out, especially from ag aviators, was, oh my God, I don't even need the flag. They said, I've been flying over this farm for five years. Those bees have always been there, but we never paid attention to them before. But the thing is, is that to an ag aviator, those, those beehives stick out. So the last thing I want to show you is that is an improper placement of a bee flag. And this is actually our state entomologist bees. If you can see, we did this just for the people. But if you can see the hives, you don't need the flag. So that flag needs to be on the other side of those trees or at the end of the road or something. It's just, all it is is an identifier that, hey, just remember there's bees in this area somewhere. So if you're on a ground rig and you're going to be spraying, just keep that in mind. So just remember that you're going to make, you're going to cook anything, you need the right ingredients, and that's kind of what you need to focus on early on in your plan development. Thank you. Oh, you're going to make me answer questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can hear me. But we're going to, um, before we break into small groups and <coughs> have you guys uh, do some reflecting on your own, I do want to give you a few minutes to ask Andy any specific questions about the experience in Mississippi. So if there are a couple of questions, um, you want to, I'm going to pass the mic. <laughs> we can probably hear it. Yeah. Well, we can, but we're recording oh. this for oh. posterity. <laughs> So we'd love you to speak. In That's unfortunate. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a try. Uh, you, you indicated that uh, from an industry sta or a registrant standpoint that you more or less kept them out of the process uh, and did some consultation, but kept them out of the meetings, maybe, if, I, if I've interpreted that correctly. Right. And, and you heard some comments from uh, Ian Kelly previously yeah. from Bayer that, you know, don't forget us, we have a lot of expertise and experience as well. 
reflecting back now, would you do things differently? No, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, and there is, I, Ian, we have talked to. Uh, I've been to the Bear Bee Care Center. It is a tremendous place, and I would encourage anybody to go. But <clears throat> there is there is that public perception. It doesn't have anything to do with the farmers or the beekeepers, but there is a public perception out there that if, if they're involved, I hate to say it, but it just looks bad. And it doesn't move the conversation forward. They are very involved behind the scenes. And, and we talk to them constantly because they are a great source of knowledge. They know more about their products than anybody else. And the research that's been done on these products is tremendous. And the thing is, is I'm, Mike's in the room. I'm going to say this, and Mike, you close your ears. <clears throat> We're praying that the science is going to lead the way on pesticide issues. But the public perception part of this is just driving the bus right now. Here's the, here's, here is the big elephant in the room. We don't have, or we do not see a pesticide problem in Mississippi. And I can tell you that because the, the reported losses in the Mississippi Delta are virtually identical to the reported losses in Neshoba County where there's little to no row crop. We don't know how to address that issue. It's kind of like asking us, how do you plan to stop beating your wife? Like I said, we don't we don't export a lot of bees. Other than you know, we don't have a lot of coming in for pollination services. But we do have bees that come to Mississippi from almonds. They come in this time of year, first of March, somewhere around there. They stay in Mississippi to get healthy. They're there. Make everybody makes their splits. Well, not everybody, but the people that are there come down to Mississippi. They make their splits, and they send twice as many hives out of Mississippi to North Dakota or, well, I think most of them go to North Dakota and make honey off of alfalfa. We are really having a hard time just wrapping our heads around how do we fight an issue that we necessarily don't think we have. So that's what I was saying about developing your plan to fit your situation. Our situation is we want to keep the beekeepers and the farmers happy. We want to keep them on each other's farms and to be honest, we've done a pretty good job considering the noise. We have had one farmer that was well, actually three farmers in one county that told their beekeeper, they said, you know what, it's just not worth it. Uh, just, I just want you to put your bees somewhere else. I don't want you. It's what we're trying to avoid, but we're stuck with that. So it's not that we don't appreciate or understand the the, the industry's involvement in this issue. And I don't think anybody appreciate, very few people appreciate what industry has done. They have bent over backwards to address this issue. But it's just to keep that, to keep that, that going forward. We, we've, we just haven't had the registrants at the table with us. It's just to acknowledge, or thank you for the acknowledgement, because uh, oh. we as an industry do feel like we've done uh, done a good bit oh, in, it's, in the it's development tremendous. of our products, as well as to participate in this process. And and I guess as as uh, other states move forward, uh, or maybe as other states share, maybe I think some of them have uh, had registrants engaged in the mm -hmm. process, and uh, it might be he good to hear hear uh, their experiences as well. Um, and would encourage oh, we've had to, we, you know we've had field states. days there, there have been field days that have been put on uh, and I'm trying to remember one of the one of the registrants is actually involved in a pollinator habitat program uh, in the Delta so there's there's beginning to be some involvement but just understanding the temperature of the water at the time that we began this process we just felt like it was it was important to uh, to keep it focused on the beekeeper and the farmer and and not distract from that. Let's take one more question and then we'll turn to 
And he, uh, Dewey Karen, I'm now in Oregon these days. You mentioned that, that you have really two populations of beekeepers, the transients that are there for a short time and those that are there much of the time. Uh, how did you address trying to get both of those at the table, the, the transients and the, the full-timer, or was it really you were talking with your the people you knew, the full-timers? Uh, we'll say there's three groups, because we didn't talk about the hobbyists. And oh my goodness, the hobbyists are, they are growing like weeds. <laughs> and, the, the, and the one thing they're bad at growing is bees. <laughs> they're, they're bee murderers. They don't understand what they're doing and they blame everything except themselves, which is unfortunate. Uh, but I think we are starting to do a better job of educating them. The larger, the larger uh, commercial guys, and when I say larger, I mean let's see, four and five thousand hives and above, <clears throat> and probably more than that even. They're involved nationally. The, the, they have a strong interest in this. Uh, and if they're located in Mississippi for a short period of time, they're, they're not as likely to be engaged with us as they are with their national or organizations. We've had some of them at the table. Uh, and, and some of them have been helpful, but they are much more interested in maintaining, they have, they have a relationship with the landowner, and they're not gonna do anything to disturb that relationship. So typically, the more acres you need, the less visible you are. They, they say, I'm not causing many problems, I'm sitting over here, but we do, we do get some good information from those guys. If you don't have a good information from your beekeepers, then you're just spinning in water. you got to have good information from your beekeepers because, like I said, you, you'll be trying to address a problem that you don't even know you have. So we, we try to be involved with them uh, a lot, but our, our big commercial honey producers, the the hundred to hundred to a thousand hives hunting producers they've been instrumental very instrumental in, in our process Thanks, Andy. thank you i'm going to get this next piece set up um so dewey's question is one that comes up a lot and the, uh one that the honeybee health coalition um in particular has uh fielded a lot of questions about that and um, it, you know it, that's um, one of the key things that we encourage you to raise that question um, in the context of what is going on in your state and and get some help here from folks um, beginning to brainstorm about how to address that kind of situation in your state um, especially if you're a state that does have a lot of beekeepers coming in uh, to your state from other places, um, that's a that's a tricky thing when we're talking about local stakeholders. How to draw that stakeholder group into the conversation? So, um, what we want to do right now is take a few minutes for you all to reflect on your particular situation that you're dealing with, and perhaps get some comments and feedback from the other folks in the room here. So we've handed out two things. One, I'm going to look at this one first, which is the one that has lots of writing on it. This is the document that's been referred to a lot this morning. This is the Safira guidance document on preparing an MP3 plan. Um, we will not be going through this in detail, but we do want you to have it if you have not had a chance to look at it. It is a really good place to start. Um, what we are going to look at right now is this document um, that has some questions. These are your worksheets for this session. And we encourage you to now, we're to take a few minutes to just quietly reflect, scan some of these questions, think about your own situation in your state. These are the kinds of questions that we think you're gonna wanna be reflecting on very early in the process to get started. Touching on some of the things that Andy um, has so eloquently put in, in his um, uh, presentation here, but really understand the types of pollinators that you have, what are the resources that you're gonna to need to actually run this process, like money and staff and a few other things that are gonna be important to actually get that done. Um, 
And based on the kinds of pollinators and the kinds of crops that you have, who are some of the stakeholder groups that might have to be involved and you know who would be good uh, representatives of those stakeholder groups? As Andy said, really thinking about some of those people who are going to be really knowledgeable and also be um, willing to work within the system. And finally, any logistical considerations. So what we want to do, we're going to give you a few minutes to just reflect on things, jot a few ideas down, um, and then we're going to invite you to, to talk amongst yourselves if you're with people you know from um, uh, your state or your tribe please go ahead and talk and then in a few minutes we'll cut that off and we're going to talk in the bigger group and you'll have a chance to raise some questions or, or you know share some thoughts thanks